God richly bless you in the mighty and exalted name of Jesus Christ. I want to greet everybody tonight to Bible study. I want to greet you all. Uh, everybody who is watching the study right now and those who will be watching at another time or later time, I want to greet you in the mighty and exalted name of Jesus. Amen. I want to salute every saint here tonight. And I want to say that I find it a privilege one more time to be able to be breaking bread with us and be bringing the word of God to us one more time. I pray God that at the end of this session tonight that we will be blessed. Praise God. So tonight we do our last week on the subject, the presence of God. And you know, we started in the book of Exodus and this is where we're going to end tonight in the book of Exodus. So let us go to the scriptures we have a far way to go. Let's look at Exodus chapter 33 and we'll read through a couple verses. Exodus chapter 33 as we look at the slide and we will read through a couple verses. It says from verse 1 to 3, And the Lord said unto Moses, Depart and go up hence, thou and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt, unto the land which I swear unto Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob, saying, Unto thy seed will I give it, and I will send an angel before thee, and I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. For I will not go up in the midst of thee, for thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. Jump to verse 5. And the Lord said unto Moses, Say unto the children of Israel, Ye are a stiff-necked people. I will come up in the midst of thee in a moment and consume thee. Therefore now put off thy ornaments from thee, that I may know what to do unto thee. And the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by the Mount Herob. They will jump to verse 12 and 16. And Moses said unto the Lord, See, thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with thee. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, and that I may find grace in thy sight. And consider that this nation is thy people. And he said, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. And he said unto him, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. For when shall it be known here? that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight. Is it not in thine that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, I and thy people, for all the people that are upon the face of the earth. And we'll jump to the last from verse 12 to 16. Well, that, that's where we stop. Praise God. Now, I want us to understand, firstly, that the narrative we read comes from the second book of Moses called Exodus. Praise God. And Exodus really is a Greek word. And it actually means departure or going out. So the Bible, as we know, the Old Testament was originally written in Hebrew. And it so happened in about A.D. 3rd century. Um, there was a set of people, by the time the children of Israel uh, came out of Babylonian captivity, we realized that the Grecians uh, became the dominant power. And because they were the dominant power of the day, they influenced the people to speak Greek. And it so happened that because they were now speaking Greek language, praise God, it so happened that they decided uh, to translate the Bible from Hebrew to Greek because the majority of the people by that time were speaking Greek. All right? So the Greek translation of the Hebrew text is what we call the Septuagint. 
and the Septuagint practically is where we get the term Exodus from. Amen. Because the original Hebrew name was not Exodus. So Exodus, the word Exodus is Greek and it means departure and it means going out. Praise God. And we find that the title for the book is very fitting because it actually gives a record or it gives a story of the departure of the children of Israel from Israel to Egypt or from Israel from Egypt sorry so they were departing from Egypt and the, the book of Exodus gives that information as the children of Israel depart out of Egypt praise God now there are many events that took place um, before we actually reach chapter 33 that we just read and it's it's always good for us to put things in their proper context so that we can understand why Jesus or why God had to call the children of Israel at the time as stiff naked people if you can remember the book of Exodus started amen with the children of Israel being in bondage they were in bondage in Egypt praise God and we remember carefully that they, when they came down into Egypt originally, amen, Joseph, uh, there was a Pharaoh that knew Joseph and he was good to the people. But the Bible clearly said in the first chapter of Exodus that there arose a Pharaoh that did not know Joseph. And because he did not know Joseph, he started to treat the children of Israel as slaves. Praise God. And for many years, 400 and something years, they cried to God and God eventually heard their prayers and he rose up Moses. And if you can remember, Moses was the one who God brought to the Sinai region after he uh, killed the Egyptian and he had to run for his life. He went to the Sinai region and God made a promise to him in Exodus chapter 3. God said to him that he was going to send him back for the people. And he said he was going to bring them back to that place, which was Sinai, amen, as a testament that he, God, has done it, praise God, and as a testament that he will be able to deliver them and keep his word, praise God. So remember that God uh, used Moses and Aaron, praise God, to go back for the people. And it so happened that he went and they brought 10 plagues upon the Egyptians. Amen. And there are practically eight different stations that we see that took place between uh, Exodus chapter 1 and where we are at chapter 33. So for example, eh, after they left Egypt, God brought them out of Egypt. The first place that they stopped was a place that was called Sakot. And at Sukkoth, practically what God did was organize the camp for departure. Then they went to the edge of uh, the, 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 the border of the, the Sinai region at a place called Etham. And this is where God actually began to guide the people. He became a pillar of cloud by day to them and a pillar of fire by night. Praise God. Then they get to Pekiriot. Praise God. And this is where the children of Israel were now um, being uh, chased, as it were, by Pharaoh and his army. Praise God. And we know that what God did, God was able to devour uh, the Egyptians in the Red Sea. Amen. Then from there they rejoiced and they went to a place that was called Mara. So we had station number 5 in Exodus chapter 15. And this is where he made the bitter water sweet. Amen. And then from Mara they went to Ilim. And in Ilim was a nice place because it, 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 it described it as having 12 springs and 70 palm trees you know it was a it was, a, it was another station that they stopped along the way and at this by this time they were now at the wilderness of sign praise god and and the people murmured amen to moses and god was able to bring manna to the people and god provided quail for the people then from uh the wilderness in the wilderness of sign they went to a place called rephidim and rephidim is where god uh moses 
strike the rock. Amen. They were asking God uh, for water and Moses strike the rock. Amen. And, 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 and water came. Praise God. And we also found that it was at this place, Rephidim, that they actually fought the battle against the Amalekites, the strong army, the major army of the day that wanted to stop them, that group. And God had to, God had to create a way and, and God would deal with them later on. And then from there, they went to Horeb, which was Sinai. Praise God. And at Sinai, a couple of stuff happened. They were now at Sinai. And this is where they're going to stop. From the time they left Egypt to this particular point was about three months. Praise God. And this is where God had promised Moses that he would have brought the people. But God had a plan for them. And, and God called Moses now up into the mountain. And God said, look here, nobody must touch the mountain or even come close to the mountain lest they die. And Moses was the only one who went up. And we know by the time we reach Exodus chapter 20, Moses got the law. Praise God. Moses got the law and he got all the, the plan for the tabernacle. But something happened when Moses was on his way down. Because on his way down, he met Joshua at the foot of the hill. And Joshua heard the noise of the people. And they were shouting. And, and Joshua said unto Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. Amen. As far as Joshua was concerned, he was hearing a noise of war. But Moses, being the man of God, said, no, that's not the shouting of, 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 of war. That's the shouting of worship. And we know what took place there. We realize that while Moses went up in the mountain in chapter 20 and he got the 20 commandments, the 10 commandments, amen, praise God, in chapter 20, it so happened that while he was there getting the commandments, thou shalt have no God before me and thou shalt not make any graven images. While the first two commandments that were given to him, while he was getting them on the mount, the people were actually breaking the commandment because they came to Aaron and Aaron, they said, look here, Moses don't look like he's going to come back. And they, 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 they asked Aaron to, to use their ornaments and their goals and they, they built a golden calf and they were worshipping this calf. So when Moses came back down to the foot of the mountain, what he saw, praise God, were the people uh, worshipping a golden calf. Praise God. And, and, and it, 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 it hurt him because we know what happened that on that day, God used, as it were, the Levites to kill over 20,000 of these men. Amen. Um, he had a, had a separation at that point between who is of God and who is not of God. Praise God. Moses was very upset with the people that he threw down the commandments and he broke them. Amen. He was upset. And that brings us to where we... The narrative that we read in chapter 33. So in chapter 33, God told Moses that he would not go up with the people. He said he would send an angel to go ahead of them. But he, God, will not go up with them. I know why. Because the people are a stiff, naked people, my God. Lest I consume thee along the way. Praise God. You know, as, as I thought about this, I, I remember reading this as a young man, as a young Christian. And I thought to myself that how upset uh, it, 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 God must have felt knowing that he had brought the people all this way. Amen. And it so happened that these people, press, praise God, were doing things that they wanted to do. Amen. When they talk about being stiff naked. Praise God. Stiff naked actually means that they were very stubborn. It means that they, 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 they didn't want to listen. But I, as I grew in Christianity, I realized that the lives of these people uh, is a true mirror sometimes of us. And we have to be very careful that we are not quick to judge them and say, boy, how oh, they should do this. Because if we should check our lives, sometimes we sometimes are a stiff-naked people too. We are stubborn. And let me tell you a story that I heard recently. There is a story about a man who had a donkey. And for years, praise God, for years he would, he would, he would actually carry that donkey 
uh, ride that donkey and he would deliver, as it were, his sales, his goods to people. So it so happened that because he was delivering the goods to the people, every path he would go along the way, he would actually, so as he traveled along the main road, he would not pass any path. From he reached a path, he would turn down into that path because he was selling things to people. So part number one, he turns down there to ensure that he gets to the customers. Then he would come back out, go along the way. Then part number two, he would, he would never pass any path. It so happened that the man decided that he was going to sell that donkey. And he sold the donkey to a man. But the man realized something about the donkey. When he was trying to ride the donkey on the main road to go, for example, to another location, he realized that every pathway that that donkey passed, he would have turned down into it. And it, it, it took him a while, it took him a while to try to retrain the thinking process of this donkey. Because he was so caught up, amen, he was so learned the old ways from his young donkey all the way up. That this is what he knew and this is what happened to the children of Israel. Amen. They were stiff naked people and stubborn set of people for, for 400 years. All they knew was the ways of Egypt. And here it is that God had to know be retraining them in, 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 in relation to couple stuff. So as we jump back onto the slide, we realize that brethren, as we look at our lives, it's a true reflection, praise God, of even how we are. But I am here to tell you that God is in the process of retraining our mind. Praise God. As a church, we were in bondage of sin. And God was the one who took us out of Egypt. And he took us out of sin. And because he did that all your life, amen, you were in sin. And God is in the process now of retraining us. I want if somebody would allow God to retrain them, to retrain your mind. So God is in the process of retraining how we think. The Bible said in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. God is in the process of correcting us at times. Many times as we, as we realize that as we go along our way, we tend to do things the old way. But the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 6 to 11, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. He said, if you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if he be without chaste chastisement, whereof are all partakers, then are ye bastards and not son. I'm saying that God is in the process of retraining you. He's saying that the way you used to doing things is not the same way anymore. You have to love them that hate you. You have to do good to them that, dis that, that, that despise you. And the Bible says, if, 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 they, if, they, if they tell you to go one mile, you must go two. You know, he's in the process of retraining our thought process. And you know why? Because we had an old master who had us along a particular path. But guess what? The day you became saved, the day God decided to take you out of sin, amen, and bring you along a process to a promised land, he is now our new master. And guess what? We have to follow him. So let us not be quick to criticize Israel. Because like that donkey who was used to turning down every path as he go along the way. Had to learn and retrain his thought processes. That's why the Bible says, Where it all shall a young man cleanse his ways. But by taking heed to the word of God. Thy word have I what hid in my heart.
that I might not sin against thee. In other words, it is the word of God that as we grow in grace and in the knowledge of God, that it retrains our process. Now, another thing that we learn from the scripture is that God was concerned that he wasn't going to consume the people. Amen. God was saying because Israel was stiff naked, he would not go. Because if he go with them, he's going to consume them. And we need to remember this at all times that God is a consuming fire. We must always be cognizant of the fact that he is not somebody to play with. Amen. Fire is something that you can admire, but fire is not something to play with. Amen. And if you handle fire incorrectly, you run the risk of being hurt bad. When we reach the place where we lose our fear of God, amen, we run the risk of going into the arms of a consuming fire. So the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 7 that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In other words, praise God. God is concerned that you become so uh, used to his presence that you take it for granted. But guess what? The fear of the Lord, the presence of the Lord can never be taken for granted. Amen. Them that fear God is the beginning of wisdom. And fear in the scripture is not fear as in afraid. But it speaks to reverence. Amen. The Bible says in Psalms 128 and verse 1, Blessed are all who fear the Lord. In other words, blessed is everyone who reverence God. And the moment we forget that fact, we run the risk, amen, of taking in strange fire into the house. And we realize an example in scripture that shows us that we have to take the ways of God very seriously. So for example, Nadab and Abihu, who were the sons of Heron, the Bible says in Leviticus chapter 10 and verse 1, and I'll find that scripture, Leviticus chapter 10 and verse 1, it says, And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer, and put fire therein, and put incense thereon, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. Praise God. And the Bible said, And there went out fire from the Lord. Hallelujah. And it devoured them, and they died before the Lord. We cannot take the presence of God for granted. We run the risk, or we run the risk, like Nadab and Abihu, praise God, that God will uh, devour us, uh, that, he will, that, 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 that the fire of the Lord will come upon us, and we can die in his presence. We can remember Uzzah, in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 1 to 7, and 1 Chronicles chapter 13, from verse 9 to 12, when the Ark of the Covenant was on its way up on a cart, and, Uz, and the Bible said it practically caused a little shaking, and Uzzah pushed his hands to, to hold up the cart. And we know what happened. God smote him dead. Let us never uh, take the presence of God for granted. And you might say, this is Old Testament. Amen. This is something that took place in the Old Testament. God don't operate like that. But let me remind you of Acts chapter 5 from verse 1 to 11. There was a person that was called Ananias and Sapphira. And these two people decided that they were going to lie in the presence of God. They decided that they took the presence of God for granted. Amen. And instantly as they told a lie to the man of God, praise God, they dropped down dead. We have to be careful that we do not take the presence of God for, God for granted. And this was the concern that God had for the people. He said, look here, Moses, I told you back in Exodus chapter 3 that I'm going to bring them here. From this point on, I'm going to send an angel ahead of them. And I am not going to go. My God. And the Bible said that the news reached the people. The news reached the people. And the Bible said when the children of Israel heard 
that God wasn't going with them, praise God, the Bible said they mourn because they realize that if they have lost God, they lose everything. Remember, you know, in chapter 32, praise God, we see where they had made a worship a golden calf. They made and they worship a golden calf the chapter before. And these same set of people, praise God, realize that, look here, if God decide that he's not going to go with us, if we lose the presence of God, we lose everything. So many people think that this is, they, they look on the outside and the grass looks greener on the outside. But when they step on the outside, outside of the presence of God, I've, I've seen many examples where, 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 where people become depressed when they realize that they lose his presence. Because when you lose his presence, you lose everything. And they realize this. The Bible says in Exodus 33, 4, and when the people heard these evil tidings, in other words, they heard what God had said. Moses must have communicated this to the camp. That God said, look here, he's not going to go with us. And the Bible said, and they mourned. And no man did put on him his ornament. And it's interesting that they did not put on them their ornament. We'll talk about that later on. So, if you can remember, and let me not even jump there. In Exodus chapter 32, it was... The, 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 it was the ornament that they had, the gold they had, and the earrings that they had, that they used to build that golden calf. When God decided that he was not going to go with them, they decided that they were going to take it off. So let me say to you, if you want to go with God, then you must reach a place or a position we are willing to remove the obstacles. So the Bible says in Exodus 33 that therefore no, and this is God talking to them. Because they are saying, they, 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 Moses go back and Moses said, God, please, you know what, we are beg you. And God says, no, put off thy ornament, or, ornaments from thee, that I may know what to do unto thee. And the children of Israel did what? They stripped themselves of their ornament by the Mount Horeb, Holy Ghost. For us to have the presence of God, brethren, many times there are things in our lives that God must strip us off. Sometimes it's a habit that you have that is holding you back. And God is saying, if you want me to go with you, remove your ornaments. So the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1, Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight, my God, and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience, praise God, at the race that is set before us. Verse, other verse said, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher for our faith. If you want God to come with you, you must be in a position where you're willing to strip every ornament, all the bad ways, all the bad habits. God, I'm willing to lay it aside with you. Sometimes it's not even something bad. But sometimes we must let it go so that we can have a greater capacity in our lives to be of service for Jesus. There are some little things that we have to let it go, my God. Some little anger in our hearts for the brethren that has wronged us. Sometimes we have to let it go. Some little things that happened years ago, praise God. And we're still holding on to it. And God is saying, I can't go with you because you have your ornaments on. This was the thing that caused the obstacle in the first place. Why God called them a stiff-necked people. 
The same jewel that they use, jewelry that they use to build this golden calf. Notice they first recognize it and they stripped it from themselves. And God said, look here, if you are going to want me to come, tell Israel to strip themselves of their ornament by the Mount Horeb. So we've seen that they were still at the same place, Mount Horeb. And God is saying, before we even move and start going north, tell them to have to let it go. I wonder if somebody could just type in the, 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 the chat, let it go. Let it go. I don't know what it is, but we are all aware in our lives that there are things that will hold us back, hallelujah, from getting where God would want us to be. But sometimes, many times, God is saying to us, before I can move with you, Praise God. You have to let it go. You have to strip yourself from those obstacles. You have to strip yourselves from those things, praise God, that is holding you back. You have to strip yourself from those people that is keeping you out of God's presence. Those friendships. Those discussions. Hallelujah. You have to let it go. Those things in your heart that you know shouldn't be there. You have to let it go. Because when we let it go, we are putting ourselves in a position for God to go with us. God says to the children of Israel, now put off thy ornaments from thee. Somebody, put off thy ornaments from thee. Ornaments is something that is of value. It's, it's, it's not no cheap thing. It's something that you probably, uh, you know, sometimes it's even the, 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 the type of work you're doing. It's causing hindrance between you and God. Sometimes you have to, by faith, let it go and ask God to, to put you in a place where you can serve him right. Whatever it is, let it go. So that you can be in a position, you can have a greater capacity in your life to be of service for Jesus. I wonder before we continue that somebody is willing to search themselves, to look at that way, that habit, that ornament. And I can tell you this, brethren, when God is getting ready to move you in another dimension, he has a way of stripping you, my God. God have a way of removing things from your life. But God is saying, because my presence is of the most value to you, you have to let it go. Let it go. Then we move to verse 11. Praise God. And in verse 11, praise God, the Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, Face to face, as a man speaking unto his friends. Now let me give you a little background, because where we stopped was verse 7. So from verse 8 to 11, we see Moses would normally go into the tabernacle to worship. And the Bible said, as he worshipped God, the, 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 the cloudy pillar would descend, and it would stand at the door of the tabernacle. And the Bible said, the experience was so great, that when all the people saw the cloud pillar standing at the door of the tabernacle, that they, they would actually rise up at their particular tent door and they would worship. And the Bible said, and the Lord would talk to Moses face to face as he talked to a friend. But I want to draw our attention to Moses' assistant. So the Bible says, and the Lord spake with Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. And when Moses finished, the Bible said, he turned again into the camp. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, he departed not out of the tabernacle. My God. When you want the presence of God, sometimes it will require us lingering 
in the presence of the king of kings. Because Joshua understood the value of God's presence. He was willing to linger a little longer in the presence of the king. And that made a big difference. No wonder when Moses died, it was Joshua who took over. That man loved God. And we recognize that God has a special place in his heart for people who love God. Moses was done operating his work. Moses was done doing what he had to do. But Joshua, my God, the son of Nun, a young man, the Bible said he departed not out of the tabernacle. In other words, there, 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 there has to be more to God than this. Even after seeing all of this and seeing how God dealt with Moses, he must have had a godly jealousy. And he decided that he was going to linger a little bit more in the presence of God. Sometimes, brethren, how much do you want the presence of God? How much do you desire the presence of God? We have been talking about the presence of God for two weeks we have, or three weeks. We have been looking at it from different angles. But how much truly do we want the presence of God? How much do we value the most expensive resource this world has ever seen? My God. And Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, he departed not out of the tabernacle. He was willing to stay at that place because he wanted God. And we see this example that God have a way of highlighting people who, who want his presence. So for example, the Bible talk about Mary. There was Mary and there was Martha. But Martha was busy doing her everyday work. The Bible says in Luke 10, 41 to 42, and Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. Martha was worried about what was taking place. You know, she was, she was busy taking care of the kitchen duties and taking care of the food and making sure that this is operating and this is doing. She was just a busy bee. And it's okay to be a busy bee sometimes. You know, sometimes we can be in the house of God and we are busy. But there must come a point in time where we linger, where we linger. The Bible says, but one thing, not two things, not three things, not four things, but one thing is needful. And Mary had chosen that good part. And guess what? Because she has chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. What did Mary love? Mary was willing. When, Ma when Martha was busy working in the kitchen and working here and doing this and doing that, Mary decided that if the master is here, I'm going to sit at his feet. There is something about the presence of God. The Bible talks about Enoch. In a, in a society where you had many people. By the time we reach Enoch in Genesis chapter 5. The, there was a lot of people already in the earth. But of Enoch, the Bible said, and Enoch walked with God. My God. That term, that phrase, walked with God, speaks to the fact that he had a contempt continuous relationship with God he probably God was the first person he spoke to in the morning God was his continuous friend he was so close to the master he loved the presence of God so much that the Bible said and he was not in other words God, God said I can't afford for this man to die and the Bible said Enoch walked with God and he was not why for God took him my God there's always a deeper place to go in the presence of God. Aaron decided, look here, I must get God. I must get him. Anna, the Bible says in the New Testament, she departed not from the temple, but served God with fasting and prayers night and day. Brethren, how much do you want the presence of God? Do you consider yourself to be like a Joshua? 
Do you consider yourself to be, praise God, like a Joshua who decided that he was not going to give up? He decided that even though Moses, praise God, had finished his daily duties and the presence of God spoke to Moses, he was willing to linger a little bit more. Brethren, the presence of God is valuable. The presence of God is the most precious thing. How much do you want it? And it doesn't matter how far you have gone and how much you know. There's always a deeper place to go. There's always more treasure to discover. Because by the time we reach verse 11 of Exodus chapter 33, the Bible said, And Moses said to the Lord, See, thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name. So here, here is Moses having a conversation with God. And he said, God, you say you know me by name. I have found grace in your sight. He said, No, therefore I pray thee, my God, if I have found grace in your sight. He said, Show me now your way that I may know thee, that I might find grace in thy sight. And consider that this nation is thy people, my God. There is always a deeper place to go as it relates to the presence of God. Now, none of us, truthfully, can deny that Moses actually had a relationship with God. And I, and, and I thought about what Moses was asking God. Listen again. Moses said, no, therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me no that way. He said, that I may know thee. And when I read that, I was saying, what is Moses actually saying? Because truth be told, praise God, Moses met God in the burning bush. You can remember you now. In Exodus chapter 3, the Bible says, when Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of the Midian, and he was in the backside of the desert, and the Bible said he came to the mount of God, and that same place, Horeb. The Bible said, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And the Bible said, and he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. This was not a man where does 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 nilly willy. He saw the supernatural of God. He was a man who saw the power of God through the plagues that happened in Egypt. Praise God. The man grew up as an Egyptian, trained in the Egyptian school, knew all the gods of Egypt, and God was willing. To use him to show him that the power of God. So for example, he attacked Happy, which is the Egyptian god of the Nile. What did God do? God turned water into blood, the Nile into blood because it was an attack on Happy. He attacked Heket, which is the Egyptian god of fertility. And what did God do? That God have a, have a frog look face. And what did God do? God make frogs come out of the river Nile. This is what Moses is seeing now. He might talk Geb, which is the Egyptian god of the earth. What did God do? God make lies come from the dust of the earth. He had talked half the Egyptian god of love. What did God do? God caused death on the cattle and the livestock. This was the god that they looked for in terms of love and protection. And God attacked Hathor, God attacked Isis, which is the Egyptian god of medicine and peace. What did God do? God turned, God put boils and sores upon the Egyptian. Moses was seeing all of this and he knew these gods. What did God do? God attacked Nut, which is the Egyptian god of the sky. How we know? God caused hail to fall down in the form of a fire. 
So they, they, they would have looked to not to try to stop that. But God said, I am God. Then God attacked Seth, which is the Egyptian god of storms and disorder. By sending locusts to block out the whole sky. And then God attacked Ra, which is the son of the Egyptian, by making the day a complete darkness. And then God ultimately attacked Pharaoh. Which is the ultimate power of Egypt by causing death to the firstborn. And Moses saw all of this firsthand. Moses saw the power of God through the plagues in Egypt. Moses saw the power of God when he was when, when, when he went when he came to the Red Sea. And God said, What do you have in your hand? I'm saying rod, I'm saying use it. And he stretches is 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 and, and, and God caused east wind to come and to, to move the sea in such a way that it caused dry land. Moses saw all of this. Moses could have been one to brag to say, I have I have I, I know enough about God, man. I I, I I know God, man, I know the presence of God, man. And the, what is there to know? All of these experiences that I told you about took place before Exodus 33. And in Exodus 33, hear the prayer of Moses as he spoke to God. He said, that I may know thee, my God. Can I tell somebody that there is a deeper place to go in God? With all the experience that Moses has, Moses was still yearning, praise God, for the presence of Almighty God. There's always a deeper place to go. Moses was not contented with yesterday's experience. Moses make a comment and say, Now, therefore, I pray thee, and I, and I emphasize the now. Now means at this present time or at this moment. He said, I pray thee. He said, if I had found grace in the sight, show me now thy way that I may know thee. We cannot be comfortable, brethren, with the experience that we had yesterday. The prayer says, give us this day our daily bread. God fill you yesterday. What was the last time you checked? Are you filled today? My God, Holy Ghost. God gave you manna yesterday, revelation yesterday, but do you have any word today? There's a little song, there's a little song that we, a hymn song that, I, that I've grown to love. It says more about Jesus. Let me learn. More of his holy will discern. Spirit of God. My teacher be showing the things of Christ to me. There's always a deeper place to go. It doesn't matter how much of God's presence you had yesterday. You can't exhaust the infinite God. You can't, you can't say you have, you have upheard all the treasures that exist in the Almighty God. Moses said, look here. Show me now thy way that I may know thee. I pray God that somebody will be, will be stirred, will be moved to a place where they are no longer comfortable with the experience they had five years ago. Habasha. They are no longer comfortable with the experience they had three weeks ago. They are not even comfortable with what they had Sunday. Because every day, I am going deeper. There's always deeper to go. And I'm not saying that we don't make mistakes and errors along the way. But brethren, like Moses, God, I'm not comfortable with what happened. I'm not comfortable with where I am. God, I know there's a reason why you're stripping me. I know there's a reason why you're doing this because my ultimate aim, my ultimate desire is to learn more, is to experience more, is to discern more, is to feel more. Hallelujah. Is to, is to get more of God. So Moses made a statement and said, If you are not going, I am not going to go. 
So the Bible said in Exodus chapter 33, verse 14 to 15, and, it's, and, and he, God said, and I put the God there because I want to know who the he is, my presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. And Moses now said unto him, if thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. In other words, don't make us move from here. When I thought about that, I'm saying, how many of us are willing to take the stance that we are not going to move? We are willing to put our lives on a standstill. We're not moving unless God moving with us. Are you willing to take that stand with God? Are you willing to put your very life on pause and say, if God is not in this, I am not going to do it. Even if the thing that you are moving towards has some form of value financially, even if the thing has some form of reward for you in your, in your job world or in your education world or whatever the case is, if God is not a part of it, no matter how lucrative it looks, I am willing to not be a part of it. If your presence is not going to go with me, then don't make us move from here. Are you willing to not move until God moves? My God. Like the scripture says in Exodus chapter 40, praise God. And verse 36, praise God. To verse 37, Exodus chapter 40, from verse 36 to 37. And it says, praise God. And when the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud were not taken up, then they journeyed not until that day it was taken up. God, if your spirit stop me here, so here some stop. Hallelujah. Are we willing to be patient enough to wait on God? Like the preacher preached Sunday from Psalm 37, 7. Rest in the Lord. Are we willing to rest in the Lord and to wait patiently for him? According to Psalm 37, 7. Are we willing to take on an Isaiah 40, 31 approach? But they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. God, it is hard. God, I know that things are progressive. Everybody seems like they're going ahead. But God, if you not going go, I not going go. If you are not in it, I am not willing to be a part of it. I'm not going to change for the world. I'm not going to change for Dick, Tom or Harry. I will put my life on pause and I will only move halaba, if God is willing to go with me. God, if you are not going to go, I am not going to go. And there's a reason for that. When you move outside of the presence of God, then nobody recognizes you as a child of God. So it brings me to the next point in Exodus chapter 33 and verse 16 it says for wherein shall it be known praise God that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight is it not in that thou goest with us so shall we be separated praise God I and thy people from all the people that are upon the face of the earth the NIV put it this way what else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? What is special about the people of God? What makes you different than everybody else? And the simple answer is that you have God with you. Moses was saying that what will make us different from everybody else? If it's not you, God. In other words... I can't go unless you go with me. Because guess why? You, God, is the person who distinguishes us from everything else. We should never aim to be known by anything else but by the fact that we have the presence of God. A lot of people are aiming to be known by 
how rich they are. Praise God. But that don't distinguish you from the rest of the world. Some people they come to church and they, they think that because you have a good choir that can sing, it's going to differentiate Faith Chapel from the rest of the world. No. Some people think that because the preacher is eloquent and he can speak well, it's going to differentiate you or distinguish you from others. Or any other thing. But we should never aim. The only thing that will set your people apart. What distinguishes us from everybody else. Is the fact that we have the presence of God with us. So the presence of the Lord. Is what is going to set us apart. So God. If you not going to go. I not going to go. Because guess what happened. Is that the fact that you are with me that makes me different than everybody else? Is the fact that you are with me that sets me apart? That makes me a royal priesthood? That makes me a holy people? That makes me a peculiar people? The presence of God. What distinguishes us from everybody else is the fact that we have the presence of God with us. The defining mark for the child of God is its presence. The defining mark for the child of God is the anointing. Hallelujah. The defining mark for the child of God is God himself. So let me say it again. If you lose the presence of God, you lose everything. I've been sitting back and I've been thinking about this whole subject about the presence of God. And I say, God, like Moses, if you don't go with me, I don't want to go. God, I've made mistakes in my life. But God, don't remove your presence. Take not, David, say your Holy Spirit from me. Because that is what is going to separate me from everybody else. If you lose God... You might be, still be able to sing. But people are going to realize that there is something that is missing in your life. The anointing. If you lose God, you might be able to still play an instrument. But people are going to realize that there is something that is missing. If you lose God, you might be able to go around the pulpit and deliver a word. But somebody is going to realize that people are going to know, brethren. The defining mark, Hakuba, for the child of God is his presence. The defining mark for the child of God is the anointing that flows from the head even down to the feet. The defining mark for the child of God is to have God himself. When you have God, what you have is the glory of God. So there's a scripture that we read earlier. Let me just jump back at it. It says, and he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Moses realized that, look here, there is something that is linked to having the presence of God and the glory of God. And say, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all thy goodness pass before thee. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. And will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And will show mercy upon whom I will show mercy. And he said, thou canst not see my face. For there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place. By me. And thou shalt stand upon a rock. Hallelujah. And it shall come to pass. While my glory passeth by. That I will put thee in the cleft of the rock. And will cover thee with my hands while I pass by. 
and I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. The glory of God abides in the presence of God. The hunger for more of God is the mark for true revival and relationship. Show me thy glory. Moses had experience with God, but he was not satisfied with that. He wanted more. The more a man knows of God, the more desirous he, he is to know God. God, show me thy glory. Moses did not want a blessing. He got that. He knew what it was to get a blessing from God. He wasn't asking God to fix the issue. He wasn't asking God to give him more food. He wasn't even asking God to correct the people. His desire, having experienced something, he, he wanted more of God. He wanted God himself. When I think of this scripture, show me thy glory. It reminds me of what God said to Abraham. He said, God said, fear not Abraham. He says, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. That is Genesis chapter 15 and verse 1. God is saying, Moses is saying, God, I don't want, I don't want the hands of God. I don't want us, I don't just want, I don't, I don't just want things from God. When I talk about the presence of God, I want God. I want you. Show me your glory. One theologian put it this way. He said, now Moses' prayer was to see the kabod. The kabod is, 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 is what we call the manifested glory. What he was, it was the literally the weight of God. My God. You see, Shekinah and 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 and, and Kabod are, 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 are practically not the one and the same. Shekinah is a word that the the the, 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 the Levites, the Levites, the, the Pharisees came up with long after. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a rabbinic word. But the Hebrew word kabod speaks deeper than just Shekinah. It speaks to the literal weight of God. It means the glory of God. It speaks to the, 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 the quantity. It speaks to splendor. It speaks to dignity. My God. Moses was asking God to show him something that was heavier than him. When we desire the presence of God, he will manifest himself to us. And God said to Moses, I will make all my goodness pass before you. He said, I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. Note the two things he asked, he said, God said he would do to him. One, he was talking about the goodness of God. So God would have revealed not just his power, not his wrath against sin, but he would report his, his true nature. He would show up uh, and that would be displayed in his goodness. And not only that, he would, he would, he would proclaim to him his name, which represents his actual character. God was promising to reveal his character to Moses. Not just literally that you know me as, as Jehovah this or Jehovah that. He said, look here, when I, when I declare myself to you, Moses, when I put this weight on you, you're going to get to know me in a different dimension. The glory of God abides in his presence. And can I tell you, Exodus 33, verse 21 to 33, or better yet, 31 to 33 says, And the Lord said, Here is a place by me. 
It says, and he shall stand on a rock. So it shall be while my glory pass by that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and will cover you with my hand while I pass by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face you shall not be seen. Every one of us can find a place in the presence of God. There's a place in God, but that place is in the cleft of the rock. Now, for us to get an understanding of what God was saying to Moses, I just went take it a little theological a little bit. There's a principle that is called a typical principle. It's, it's practically speaks of a, that a type is divinely appointed illustration of some spiritual truth. It can be an event. It can be an object. It's practically something that God has used. A divinely appointed illustration that gives about some form of spiritual truth. That's what a type is. So it's called the type principle, the typical principle. So if we can talk about the rock, for us to understand what, what God was practically saying to Moses in type, was that I am going to give you my presence. But my presence can only be felt when you are hid inside of a rock. Now there's some important teaching that the Bible says as it relates to the rock so for example in 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 the chapter before chapter 32 in verse 4 in verse 15 in verse 18 verse 30 and verse 31 we see where moses himself called god a rock he say you are the rock of his people he say you are the rock of our salvation he say you are the rock who begot them he say you are the rock who is going to father them so we see in scripture that the Bible uses multiple times the rock. David did the same thing in the Psalms. David said in Psalms chapter 18 verse 2 and chapter 18 verse 31 and verse 46. He said God was the rock in whom David trusts and whom he blessed as the God of his salvation. He said in Psalm 27 verse 5. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He said, he shall set me up upon a rock. I will find other places, Psalm 31, Psalm 40, Psalm 61, that God is a place of shelter on the rock. My God. So what God was saying, God is going to put Moses in the cleft of a rock. The rock represented something. And the rock was going to cover him. Or better yet, in the rock, he was going to cover him with his hands. And the rock was the only safe place for Moses. For otherwise, he would have been consumed by the glory of God. In other words, we want to get into the presence of God. But there's only one place that we can go where we can experience the presence of God. And when we experience the presence of God, it's in the rock. And that rock represented something, my God. So as we look even further on in scripture, we begin to look back at the Old Testament and think about the present. We realize that what God was saying to Moses is that being in his presence or being in the cleft of the rock speaks firstly of our position in Christ. My God. Because it is only in Christ that we have perfect security and safety. Can I encourage somebody? Stay in the rock. Being in the presence of God, in the cleft of the rock, speaks of our place in God's presence here on earth. It's the dwelling place where he chooses to make his name abide. What am I saying to somebody? Stay in the rock. Be in the presence of God. Hallelujah. In the cleft of the rock. Speaks of our heavenly hope. A place has been prepared for us in the Father's house. Where we shall enjoy his eternal rest. The devil 
wants to move us out of the rock. The devil wants to remove us from that only place. The only place where we can truly experience the presence of Almighty God. The devil wants to get you to think that you can still come to church and feel God. But brethren, the truth is, probably what you're feeling is not a true representation. It's, a probably can, it's not the real thing. You probably feel a little brush. But you can only get the true presence of God when you remain in a rock. And can I tell somebody, the rock represents Jesus. It is only in Jesus that we can have access to the presence of God. It is only in Jesus that we can be covered. We can have shelter. We can have position. We can have security and safety. Even from the glory of God. If Moses was not in that rock, he would have been consumed by the presence of God. So God said, look here, I put you in the rock. I'm here to tell somebody, don't let nobody move you. Don't let no situation rock you. It doesn't matter what happens. Stay in the cleft of the rock. There is a place beside me. There is a place that you can go and still experience God. But this is only in the presence of God. The New Testament believer can experience a rest. The New Testament believer can experience eternal safety. That is found in the finished work of Christ. But the true New Testament saint can experience the true raw presence of God. But only at that place. There is a place beside me, my God. There is a place beside me. You say, here is a place by me, or there is a place by me. You say, you shall stand on the rock, and it shall be while my glory pass, that I will put you in the rock, and I will cover you with my hands, and I will pass by. What a good God. Don't come out of the rock. In week one, we learn that God has created a plan, a structure to get into his presence. In week two, we learn that your attitude determines where you go. We saw the contrast in attitude in, 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 in Luke chapter 7 between that woman, what the Bible calls a sinner, and Simon the Pharisee. One thought God owed him something because of his great works, because he was a Pharisee. But this woman taught us that we really, God owes nothing. But all that is lacking was on him or on her. And she was in need of the love of God and the presence of God. In week three, we, we looked at that woman. And she realized that she was in a state of guilt. She was the woman at the well. She was the Samaritan woman, the outcast. And we saw a guilty woman, a woman who had seven, six husbands, or five husbands, and the one that she now has is not hers. And she, but God showed us a principle of getting into his presence through worship. To the point where he says that I that speak unto thee am he. And today we, we close it by saying that the truth be told is that Jesus really in everything that we have looked at here is the only safe place into the presence of God. There's a song I want to close. It says rock of ages cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Right now we are in a storm. The storm, we're in a storm. We're in a situation. We're in troubled times. But brethren, there is a place that you can hide. There is a place that you should not neglect. 
There's a place that if you truly desire the presence of God, if you truly desire to be in, in, in the presence of Almighty God, there is a place. It's in Jesus. It's in Jesus. He's the one. If you're watching Bible study tonight and you, you, you are unsafe and you, you have never experienced God. You have never experienced, you, you feel like there's an empty place. You, 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 you are probably like that woman in St. John chapter 4 where you, you, you need something more. You know there's more to God than this. You know that there must be more to life than this. I am telling you that there is a place in the cleft of the rock. And God is willing to put you there and to let his glory pass over you. Don't you know that in his presence there is fullness of joy? And at his right hand there are pleasures forevermore. I pray God that we have learned something from Exodus chapter 33. We have learned something about the presence of God. In summary, the cleft of the rock is Jesus himself. Jesus is that rock. And it's only in Jesus... It's only in Jesus that we can get true security. It's all in Jesus that we can experience God at his ultimate. It's only in Jesus. All that we might desire. Like Paul said, all that I may know him. Not just in the power of his resurrection, but also in the fellowship of his suffering. All that we might experience him. All that we might have a desire to go deeper in him. Oh God, help us. Help me. Help me, Jesus. My desire is, I, I, I don't know what God is doing in my life. I'm not, I, 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 I often nowadays sit down and I say, God, I've experienced so many things. But I know, God, that nothing happens by chance. His ultimate desire is to pull me to him. Ultimate desire is to be with him. The presence of God. There is a place beside him. In the cleft of the rock. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. In the mighty and the exalted name of Jesus. Bow your heads as we close out this series in prayer. God bless you as we pray. Great God, we thank you tonight for one more night. One more Bible study session. One more time to be in your word. One more time to look at the principles from your word. God, help us, Lord, to experience, as it were, to have in the desires of our heart, to have you as our shield and our exceeding great reward. God, people desire many things we are living in a time where people are desirous of many things people want to go back to school and it's not a bad thing people want to experience life people want to get married people want to have children people want to do all of these things and while these things are good help us lord to put you first help us lord to desire you for as the words declare, blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. I ask you one more time, God, to wash us one more time. Make us clean. Make us ready. Give us that heart so that we may desire you, may hunger for you, we may thirst for you. For you said in your words, we must seek first the kingdom of God. In other words, seek first the rule of God and your righteousness. We thank you, God, that in your presence, God, you have moved us from a state of being guilty to a state of being innocent. And you have moved us even from a state of being innocent to a state of being righteous. Because our righteousness is not of our own. Our righteousness is of God. We thank you. But help us, Lord Jesus, to desire more of Jesus. More of Jesus, let us learn. More of his holy will discern. 
Hallelujah. We thank you, Holy Ghost. We thank you, Spirit of God. We thank you, God, for your presence that we feel tonight. And we ask you, Lord Jesus, help us, Lord, not to move. Help us, Lord, to be willing to not shift unless the cloud moves. Help us, God, to not move unless your spirit go with us. And to have that same, hallelujah, desire like Moses. God, we can't move from this place until you're ready to move us from this place. Help us, Lord Jesus, to be patient. Help us, Lord Jesus, to, to realize that you know what is best for us, even though we cannot see it. But you are the infinite God, the God who dwells in yesterday, today, and forever. We thank you one more time for this session, that, this Bible study session. And we ask you, Lord Jesus, to touch the minds, to illuminate the minds of your people as we look to you, as we look to your presence, as we look to the God of heaven, the only God, the only wise God. Thank you one more time in the mighty, in the great name, the only saving name, the most powerful name, the name of Jesus, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. God richly bless you. God richly bless you. By way of announcement, as we close, praise God, the church office, the number, the 905-0484 number uh, is now restored and you can now contact the church office um, at that number. So it's 876-905-0484. And you can also call 876-931-0081. Amen. Remember, we have church again on Sunday. Sunday school starts at 8.30. Amen. And we did have a good time. Um, the first Sunday school face-to-face -face in the sanctuary. It was, it, was, it was beautiful. Praise God. And we look forward to more people coming out to Sunday school this Sunday. Amen. Church starts at 10 o'clock. And let us come out together as we desire to get into the presence of the King of Kings. God bless you. God bless you. Praise God. So, Sunday school starts at 8.30. Amen. To 9.30. And service starts at 10 o'clock. God bless you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.